Today I want to use this to get to know my students. It's day one of school, bell rings, students come in, take a seat in your classroom, and they give you that blank stare. And I always think to myself, who are these kids? Why are they here? What do they want to learn? Why'd they take my class? So I have them do a get to know me activity. Most teachers probably do something similar or have at some point. I've had kids fill out note cards where they write their name and their grade, things they do outside of the classroom or sports that they're in. I've had students do online quizzes and surveys, scavenger hunts, interview scavenger hunts where they have to go around the room and introduce themselves to their classmates and get to know each other. All of those work to some capacity. I always get interesting information back and I'm able to have conversations with the kids about things outside of the classroom and sports that they play or hobbies that they do, books they read. But the activities themselves are boring, right? I find them boring most of the time. I, the information I like, but the actual activity of getting it, the, the mechanics of getting it is boring. And it's boring for the students mostly, or it's nerve wracking, right? Asking them to go talk to each other on the first day where they don't know anybody and they can't do it on their phones, right? You can't text, you gotta go talk to somebody nerve-wracking right so all of these I've tried and I, I've never really liked any of them I like the information I've never really liked any of them and this year I thought I'm a shop teacher I teach engineering I teach manufacturing we have a lot of cool equipment in our rooms that I can work with and use and I've got 3d printers and those are cool why don't I come up with some activity to learn about my students using those so the idea I came up with was to have my students design a personal crest like the family crest or coat of arms from the olden days, they designed this crest to represent themselves. The materials you need to run this activity are pretty straightforward. You're gonna need some paper and pencil to have the students sketch. You're gonna need a computer or a laptop with an internet connection so you can use the CAD software Tinkercad. And then if you're gonna turn these into a physical product, you're gonna need a 3D printer. To introduce this activity to my class, what I'll generally do is have a family crest or a coat of arms, just run some random one I find on the internet, displayed on my projector. I'll usually go to this website and I'll find some random one or I'll find one for my own last name and I'll display it up on the screen. And I start asking questions like, do you know what this is? Have you ever seen one of these before? Do you know if your family has one of these? Just to get their brains thinking about what it is. And then we go through a basic general history of what these family crest coat of arms were and why they were used. Probably takes five minutes, 15 minutes in total with a very good discussion. And then we move on to the next piece. So after we've gone through a general overview of what these crests are and have a good classroom discussion on them, we start getting into what they're gonna be working on. I give them the criteria for their own designs, what they have to include in their crest. And what that includes is they need to have something on their crest that represents something they're proud of, they need to include something they're good at, something that is a personal goal of theirs, and something that makes them happy. The last criteria I usually give them is a size constraint, which really only comes into play if you're going to 3D print them. Once we've gone over the basic introduction and the students know what family crests are, I hand all of my students one of these sheets of paper that has the basic intro introduction that we've already covered in class, has the criteria that we've talked about listed out for them that they can review later, and down at the bottom of the page, it has an area for them to be able to brainstorm ideas of what they want to include in their personal crest. With the section down below, I'll either have this paper projected up on the screen, kind of like you're seeing now, or I'll do this up on my whiteboard. And I'll walk through my own ideas of what I would include in each one of these areas for myself. This provides a chance for the students to kind of get to know me as well as ask a bunch of questions. And it really can create a good classroom discussion and we can have a lot of fun during that time. Once they have covered all of that information and we've, we've kind of exhausted all the questions they want to ask me, I then go through and show them what their sketches should look like and how they can incorporate their ideas that they brainstormed. I don't sketch in class. That would take a little bit too long for uh, how long I want them to be thinking about this and getting to work. So I've already pre-sketched them out for class and then I will project this up on the screen showing them how I use the same ideas in a several of my, or at least a couple of my crests, and I just rearranged them. Maybe I changed the size and the proportion, but the ideas are the same, right? Building, I'm using a hammer in, in both, you know, my house, being proud of being my house, I've done the same thing. One, maybe I include a tree, one I don't, but I'm showing them that they can use the same idea in multiple different designs and come up with two completely separate ideas that they can then decide to move forward with. 
And then I'll usually do a third one that's completely different and uses a lot of different representations from what we talked about in class or what I th thought about before class. I also show them how each of the representations should be annotated so I can kind of quickly look at it and tell what those things are to them. Right? Then from there, they get to choose one as long as it's school appropriate and we move on to Tinkercad. With their approved sketch, students then get to move on to Tinkercad, which is a great, what I consider a plug and play CAD software. Very little prior knowledge needed to get started with this program. All you really need to know is how to drag and drop materials, which is great for a first day activity. In my classes, I want my students learning by doing as often as possible. So I generally won't go through a step-by-step -step detailed tutorial of how to use Tinkercad. I'll go over four or five main operations and then I let them get to work. The first tip I share with my students is actually more of a step-by-step -step tutorial and that's how to get their work plane or their workspace set up, which is where they'll do all their designing. I have them go to settings, bottom right hand corner of your screen, and I change their units from millimeters to inches because that's what I gave them their size constraint in. And I have them change their width and their length of their work plane to the size of our 3D printer bit. That way they can visualize what they're actually creating and what it'll look like a little bit better than if we left it where it was. The other piece I do with the workspace settings is I change the snap grid or I have them change the snap grid from the default eighth inch to off. The next tips I share with my students is very quick. I show them how to click and drag an object or a shape onto their work plane. I also show them where they can find other basic shapes and objects in the different libraries that are available and that there is a search feature. I do tell them that the search is not the best. You could type in, say, something like fire, and you won't necessarily get what you're looking for in the results. But if you look through the libraries, you might be able to find several different versions of a fire or flame that you might want to use. The third tip I show them is how to size or resize an object in several different ways. So once they've brought an object onto their work plane and it's selected, I show them that they can click and drag on the nodes on the sides and edges of their object. A little bit more accurate way would be once you click on those nodes that you get your number value menu or a text box here that you could type in. Say we want this to be three and we want this one to be two. And that allows it to size it exactly to, to the dimensions that you're looking for. They also have the menu on the right hand side, your object menu where you can click and drag your width, length and height as well as type in the values you would need in those text boxes. The next tip I share with my students is how to use the align tool. Generally, this is a better option than this kind of dragging and trying to place your model exactly where you want it. If you have two objects on your screen, you can highlight both of them. Your align tool is up in the top right hand portion of your workspace. You can choose that and then it allows you to align it based on a couple of preset areas. So if I wanted to align the back edges together, I could click this back piece. Now it's aligned in that direction. And if I wanted my green block over top of my red block, I could align on the left-hand side. And that gets me to a position where they're kind of on top of each other, which a lot of times will be very helpful when making the crest. After you've got it there, then you may have to kind of click and drag to position your object where you need it. Generally, the last tip I share with my students is how to group objects together once you have them in the position and you want to turn it into one complete object. A lot of times this is the operation that they use to get the kind of the shield portion, the whole base of the crest. So here we have our two objects that we aligned in the last tip. If I highlight both of those same area as we found the align command, there is a group and ungroup command. If both of them are selected, I can select group and that turns them kind of into one object. Now when I move them, they are together. Generally, you want them to be touching or intersecting and that'll turn them into one complete object that's easier to 3D print down the line. Once the students have their completed crest and it's ready to 3D print, I have them export it into an STL format. That's what we use to 3D print. Tinkercad makes it incredibly easy to do that. In the top right-hand portion of your screen, there should be an export option. There's 3D print files. We choose STL. That will export it to your computer and download it so you can use it with your 3D printer. So a couple troubleshooting tips and things I found out running this in my class and, and practicing on my own is when you're modeling, you need to make sure that the pieces that you're working with will actually come out with the level of detail that your 3D printer can provide. Several times mine with the little people that came out uh, that I had on the bottom to represent my family, they were 
not very well detailed and it took me several different instances of changing the height in Tinkercad to get those pieces to come out. Another issue is make sure that the stuff that is showing on the top of your crest isn't actually popping out the backside as well on your Tinkercad model. A lot of my students did that and I even did that one time. And the last thing that really helped out is you need to make sure that the models that you're pulling out of Tinkercad, if you're using their pre-built shapes uh, and not trying to fabricate one on your own, that their complete model, the flame or the fire that I did on mine, was actually multiple pieces, which might be kind of hard to see here. So this is one where there's multiple pieces. So in between each of those layers, there's actually support material that I can't get out and it doesn't look very well. So if you one comes out looking weird, it's probably because it's actually not connected in Tinkercad and as it printed out, it just filled with support material. At least that's what mine did, which caused a couple issues that we had to reprint as we went through. Once they come out of the printer, they should look pretty, pretty high quality to the degree that Tinkercad will allow you to get. If we have time in my class, a lot of times a few of my students do, if not all of them, I allow them to take them from just the general color because my 3D printer just does one color at a time and allow them to paint them or color them with markers to add a little bit extra flair. And they turn out looking really, really cool a lot of times, especially if they take the time to really add some detail um, and not just kind of do individual one color for everything. So that's a project I came up with to get to know my students better using the technology we had in the room. If you have any questions or use this project in your class or some version of it, let me know down in the comments below. And thanks for watching.